in terms of sort of the the the, the, the academic field around epigraphy mm. why do you think um inscriptural evidence has been so well previously underutilized in academic studies particularly when trying to reconstruct pre-islamic beliefs and um uh, faith that's a, that's a very good question um hmm. i would say that uh, traditionally speaking, you have uh, uh, different, uh, so people who are working in Islamic history are trained um, with Islamic sources. They're trained as Islamicists, so they have different sources, their expertise pertains to that, and they rely primarily on that material to understand the past. Um, people who work with epigraphy um, are closer to archaeology. They're not uh, uh, Islamicists as such. Uh, and so um, their work, uh, the two fields uh, don't uh, overlap very much. So they've sort of been autonomous. Now, there are cases sort of someone like uh, Freddie Beeston, uh, who was a fantastic epigraphist, but also a master of the Islamic sources, brought them together. So there are individuals who have done that in the past. But generally speaking, like, for example, if I go and I study um, if, if in former times, if I went and studied uh, uh, Islamic studies and wanted to work on early Islamic history, Part of my training would not traditionally have been ancient South Arabia. Mm. I wouldn't have learned ancient South Arabia. I wouldn't have access to any of that. It just wouldn't be there, right? Um, so it's also um, very interesting. The same change is happening in Quranic studies. In former times, people who did Quranic studies would have uh, immersed themselves in things like tafsir and, you know, Islamic traditional engagements with, um, uh, with the Quran. But it's very common today that someone doing Islamic studies is also studying Syriac, maybe Greek, Ethiopic. They're looking at um, uh, late antique literature. So this is a change that's happened in sort of widening the scope and, and contextualizing, uh, let's say, uh, the Quran in its late antique uh, uh, context. So for pre-Islamic Arabia, I think that shift is changing as well in understanding pre-Islamic Arabia through pre-Islamic Arabian sources. What has also challenged people in the past, too, is... South Arabia, has, there have been fantastic additions and stuff for South Arabia. You can work with that material very well. But with North Arabia, it was very difficult to not only uh, access the material, but to process it. A lot of the stuff was, um, let's say, uh, uh, you know, in um, difficult to handle uh, uh, volumes. They're not edited. Well, I'm trying to look at an example here, but uh, to bring to you, to show you, but it doesn't matter hand drawings, the texts are poorly edited, you read the text, they don't make any sense. So it just seems like it's not very useful. So what we've done in the last, let's say 10 years, is to systematically um, approach these corpora and to try to synthesize the information and tell a story, right? At least that's what I tried to do with my uh, book on um, uh, Safiatic religion, right? So here is these are real, to use the Islamic vocab vocabulary, Jahili Arabs. All right. So let's figure out what their religious life ways look like using their sources. OK, uh, so I tried to gather everything that had to do with religion in this huge corpus and organize it, synthesize it and present it. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully it's a good starting point for people so that people working on pre-Islamic society and religion, they can take a book and say, OK, look. This is a good synthesis that presents us with the data. We can build on this. You see what I mean? So that's what's happening now. We're getting these synthesis, grammars, dictionaries, books like this, uh, databases, right? Michael McDonald has this fantastic database that he runs, um, uh, Oceana, that's just filled with fantastic stuff. But it's very easy to misuse stuff like that. I recently read an article where uh, somebody was talking about Samad uh, before uh, Islam, and he just wrote the word Samad into Oceana. And he's like, look, it's attested and Taimanitic. He found a word, sad, meme, dal, ayn. And mm -hmm. he's like, here it is. And it's, well, no, that's, if you know anything about Taimanitic grammar, that sad meme there is actually the way they would spell the, their deity, salm, sad, lam, meme. And mm -hmm. that, and that, yeah, that, that dal, ayn at the end is the verb da'a, which means to call, has nothing to do with samad in the Quran. So, you know, it, these databases are available, but they can also be very dangerous because you can misuse them if you're uninitiated. But at least people are being interested, right? And the material is there and more accessible now. So uh, what we're seeing, I think, and this is what I kind of uh, present to my students as well, is the Jahiliya and pre-Islamic Arabia are two different places. Mm. They're two different places. You can study the Jahiliya. 
you can read, you know, uh, 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 Islamic period sources like Wahhab bin Munabbih. You can read Ubaid bin Sharia and these kinds of uh, guys who are talking about pre-Islamic Arabia. They're talking about the Jahiliyyah. Okay? That is, um, there are obviously elements of reality in there, but in general, that's storyland. All right? That's a very different place than the pre-Islamic Arabia that you excavate and that you document on rocks and, 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 and rock faces and things of that. That pre-Islamic Arabia is a very different place. And there can be two disciplines, one that studies the literary pre-Islamic Arabia, the Jahiliya, and one that engages with the documentary and archaeological evidence. Yeah.